Yeah, that, it's not. Is that a Les Paul? Les Paul over here. Yeah, to the yep. left. Uh, Rickenbacker, um, Gibson, Gibson. Um, the uh, Orange Wood, which, by the way, if you like acoustic guitars, um, Orange Wood is this guitar company out of California that does all solid wood guitars for incredibly affordable prices. And they are absolutely beautiful to play. I, you know, it, I, I'm talking like a guitar, you know, that feeling you get when you're at the music store and you pick up that $3,000 Martin, you're like, I'll never pay for this. I'll never afford this. These, 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 um, these orange woods give you that feeling. It's really impressive guitar. I believe it's all sort of outsourced from China, uh, but, you know, sort of uh, uh, tuned in America and all that stuff. But I can't praise them enough. Orange wood guitars. But uh, how long have you been playing for? Oh, uh, I don't know. 30, 35 years, somewhere in that yeah. range. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're probably yeah. a lot better than I am. Cause so, like, uh, uh, whoop, I guess how to do this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this this finger. There we go. Oh, you got um, a banjo too. 1894. Oh my open lord. Open back banjo. This wow, you... is a vintage 61 Gibson Melody Maker. Oh, that's a beauty. The, the double pickup one with cutaways, so pretty hard to find. This is also a 61 Gibson. Oh my uh, lord. This is a a Blue Ridge. Oh, and beautiful. And this uh last guy is actually a Cervantes uh Jazz classical crossover guitar. Oh wow, wow! And so yeah, you are missing the mandolin, the vintage fifties harmony uke, baritone, the oh, cuatro, wow. the regular uke, the charango, um, and that's of course a... full full little recording studio setup here. So that's cool, man. So so do you do a lot of music recording? I do. I've got uh, one album that has been out since 99 mm. and uh, I have like 10 in backlog sitting on my shelf that I've never released. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. I've put out like eight, nine albums myself over the years, me and my band, you know, but it's like, you know, my, my main thing is, you know, I've been in the video game industry since, you know, I was one of the early employees at Rockstar Games. Um, you know, then I was creative director at Atari then I had, you know, I've had my own gaming companies. So games and media has always been my thing. But like, you know how it is when you're so stressed out, you know, there's nothing like these, these things to get that stress a little bit, you know, under control. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah it's my main hobby for sure. So, but uh, I, I suspect we could use the entire, uh, well, time remaining uh talking about <laughs> music gear and we shouldn't <laughs> yeah 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 no, no of course not because look i i am a a big fan um you know of your work um and i want to get into that a little bit and you know specifically i'd love to sort of take it back to the beginning about sure. how you got into video games in the first place like sort of like what kicked off that fascination and how did that lead to your first gig uh, so I got lucky being born in 1971. That meant that we got like a Sears Pong console when they came out sometime in the mid seventies. It meant that I got an Atari 2600 like early on, right? Like we had one when they came out. Um, so I've been playing video games since they came to the house, right? Um, I got, uh, into programming on my dad's Osborne one luggable and mm. then shortly thereafter on an Atari 8-bit computer in the early 1980s and actually sold my first game to classmates in a Ziploc baggie um, oh, wow. when I was <laughs> you know 14 something oh, like amazing that. three uh, a group of three or four of us formed an ersatz company we called ourselves protocom and mm. you know printed printed up labels and manuals on an Okie mate color printer and uh, <laughs> you know, all of that. Um, so, uh, and that whole time I was living abroad, actually, my mom worked for UNICEF. So mm. I would be spending summers with my dad in the U S and then going to South America the rest of the time where, where my mom was working for UNICEF. And that meant I would see all the latest arcade games that weren't available 
down there yet. Mm. Like Qbert came out or, you know, right. whatever. So I would end up making board game versions of them for my classmates mm. so that they could play. And that was actually sort of early training in game design, right? Yeah, because of course. Porting action games into turn-based games and so on was great practice. So, um, did you use yeah. graph paper? Because when I was doing that as a kid, I was using graph paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you had to calculate, you know, you, you had to calculate the byte value for each row as you were like redefining the character set or whatever. So you had to go learn, <laughs> you know, right. um, bit math, you know, uh, and all of that kind of thing to be able to do the graphics. Sure. I even wrote a tool for, um, you know, I, I stole a machine language library for, um rapid saving of binary data from a magazine right and then um built a graphical editor for character sets so it was super easy to create the custom character sets that were building blocks for graphic screens right and that's how a lot of the games worked back then yeah so yeah so got into it from there then um drifted away a little bit and then got back into it more in um, college because I was at a networked Mac campus, right? So ran D&D, &D, did all of that kind of thing, ran a uh, remote play by email D&D &D game on mm. campus oh, wow. that ended up becoming like the campus computing committee submitted a paper about it to some conference back in the day. Um, but, you know, I found the whole GUI windowing stuff had stuck too many obstacles in the way of making games, you know? Um, but I got into text muds right? and started working on those in the early nineties. And uh, that ended up becoming a job offer on Ultima online. Right. When, when Ultima online was getting started, they went looking for people who had worked in muds because they needed people who had online world design experience. Amazing. And, you know, we were working in custom scripting languages with procedural generation, with, um, you know, scalable servers and, uh, mm. you know, all of uh, and And it was all in C, uh, you know, so I was doing all that kind of stuff on MUDs. And that uh, ended up with me getting incredibly lucky to get recruited onto UO and um I wasn't originally the lead designer, but they actually laid off the original designer, which meant that I ended up lead designer of UO with the game being built mostly around concepts that myself and other mud folks, including my wife, brought to the team it's amazing. at the age of, um, <laughs> I guess, when I joined the team, I was 24. So at the age of 25. Yeah, that's I amazing. Up, I ended up leading UO from a design it, point of view. And what was... Um, Richard Garriott like in these early days? Like, ah. were, were you, uh, was he like the man in charge and would give you uh, very specific guidelines in your lead creative role? Or no. was he more like, this is the big vision, you go make it better type of guy? It, it didn't work like that at all. Richard was the executive producer for mm. the Lord British Productions group within Origin. So when I got there, Origin had five production groups. They later slimmed down to three. Oh, interesting. So like Warren Spector headed one. Andy Hollis headed one. That was all of the Janes games. Chris mm. Roberts headed one. That was the Wing Commander group, right? Like it, that's how Masterpieces, it yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Origin was a, a fun but uh, incredibly intense place to work. Crunch culture was rampant. It, mm. um, you know, all of that. The different production groups had intense rivalries. Richard really? was visiting Antarctica and going to the Titanic, <laughs> right? So that kind of thing was happening. Um, Already back then. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely. amazing. Yeah, and he had Britannia Manor, of course, which has been torn down now, but which uh, every year got rebuilt into a massive haunted house for the city of Austin. So... Richard was mostly spending his time on Ultima 9. He was not working day-to-day -day on UO. UO was very much a Skunk Works project oh, run day-to-day -day by Star Long, who was the game director and basically acted as our producer, right? Um, in terms of the game design and conceptual stuff, there was a core team of folks who had come over from the MUDs 
And then there were, you know, a couple of people who were veterans of the Ultima series. So when we all got there, the first thing we were made to do was play all of the Ultima games. But honestly, the vast majority of UO conceptually did not come from the Ultima series. It came from the stuff that we had been doing on MUDs. Yeah. And it came from that core group of about a half dozen people. So, um, yeah, it, there were elements of Ultima, like how are we going to weave in, you know, hey, in Ultima you can bake bread. But we were going, hey, we need a fully player-driven economy, right? Stuff like that dovetailed. Incredible. Other stuff like how are we going to handle the virtues turned out to be a much thornier problem. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I would put it as there was design simpatico because Ultima 7 and, and, um, and Serpent Isle had been very simmy in a bunch of ways. And those of us who came from MUDs were very oriented around building a world simulator. That, that was kind of our North. Right. Side. Right. That, that's the, that's the key, which I think, you know, not to jump ahead because I definitely want to get into this a little bit more, but as, as a student of, of, of sort of game production, I mean, like I literally worked on GTA three and vice city and midnight club two as the director, right. you know, so I, I've, I've worked on some pretty big games, you know, right. to me, the greatest video game ever made is Star Wars Galaxies, in my humble opinion. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I believe... But, an unusual pick, but I'm flattered. <laughs> uh, oh, people that I know that have played it to the level that I played it all, like, agree a thousand percent. But that Star Wars Galaxies thing, which we'll get into for sure, the birth of it was really in that kind of proof of concept of sorts, in that incredible innovation um, around Ultima Online, which created, just like you're saying, this simulated world uh, thing, right? It's like, like, like if we ever turn into a simulation and this conversation isn't a simulation, it'll trace its roots back to that Genesis moment of Ultima Online. And, and to me, that's absolutely incredible. And even all of these kids today that are obsessed with digital assets and you know, board apes selling for X amount of dollars. People were buying Ultima online uh, thread, like thread just to make a black, you know, yes. pixel suit for thousands of dollars back, back in those, you know, in those days, right? Like the true birth of digital assets, you know, with, with liquidity and real financial context. I mean, it, it was all born out of this amazing, product you know so sorry you know that was kind of a rant but i just wanted to emphasize for folks that don't know what ultima online is about how important it is to everything that came after i actually think you know uo gets named pretty regularly to lists of top 100 or top 50 games of all time mm. by the likes of time magazine and polygon sure. and whatever um but it's true right the game's been running for quarter century now and a lot of folks you know, it's dated, right? A lot of folks don't necessarily know how much came from there. For everything innovative and important in UO, there was an antecedent, okay? Mm -hmm. There was a prior game that did some amount of what UO did. But UO was the first mainstream success to bring a whole bunch of threads together and put them in. And if you go back now, um, I think it would probably surprise people to realize that um, first major video game with any character customization. First video game in which you could sit down. First mm -hmm. video game in which you could go fishing. Mm -hmm. Like as just, hey, let's be a fisherman. Where you could build and decorate a house mm -hmm. before The Sims, right? Um, uh, what else? I mean, uh, you know, run a shop. Right. 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 Um, all crafting distinction systems. between yeah. combat classes and and like trading classes and, and yeah what now they call life skills although i'm not sure where that came from um, <laughs> right. uh all of the yeah you can basically trace all the crafting that you do in video games today you can probably trace it to uo right that was where it all came from right uh the guild system guilds were all over the muds there were clans and fps's but the way guilds work today, where you've got a leader and ranks and roles and all of that, that's all been taken from UO, right? Incredible. And uh, game time cards, 
and uh, <laughs> right yeah. business innovations right the way patch notes work came because you all modeled it for everybody else the phrase the live team right i could go on yeah. it was a really large pile of stuff that we kind of brought together in one place and its influence today is so pervasive that i don't know if people recognize the fact that when they're running around in breath of the wild or mm. they're playing minecraft or you know whatever that or warcraft that, yeah, an awful lot of that stuff is derived from UO. Yeah, a lot of incredible. people think of uh, RuneScape as being kind of unique and a root, but RuneScape started out as a UO clone on a on the web. Right, right, right. like literally. Uh, yeah, so yeah, its influence is absolutely everywhere, and I feel super, super lucky to have you know landed on it as a as an absolute novice in the industry. And actually, you know, getting to, you know, to some degree, what, take charge. You, um, you know, what, yeah, what I got what, lucky. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, look, luck, luck doesn't exist, right? Like, like, there's a million different quotes that like, uh, you know, like address that sort of fallacy about luck. But, you know, one thing that I'm fascinated by is currently, I, you know, own a VR development studio. And, uh, you know, we're making um a sort of open world UGC driven sort of MMO thing uh, for Steam and Oculus. And, and you know, I'm very proud of the work that we're doing. But like one thing for me with a team of about 30 people that I, you know, that I always try to infuse without being too heavy handed is the idea that innovation can come from any level or of the organization. And that's why it's so important to play the game constantly because you never know where the, those great ideas are born from. And for you guys, what I'm, what I'm in, uh, interested in is how did like, how was that culture inside of the team that you were working on built so that all of these crazy innovations in the marketplace were allowed to breathe? Right. Cause typically change is the scariest thing there is. Yeah. Like how how would you define the the essence of what fostered that kind of thinking? UO started as a pilot project with basically an off budget 250k given straight to Richard to hire a pilot team. Mm -hmm. The pilot team, other than the one or two Ultima folks who got put on to court, sort of keep an eye on the kids consisted nearly entirely of people in their early 20s. The youngest was 18, fresh out of high school. And we were put on a different floor, basically locked in a closet, if you want to think of it. It was a little wing that had four offices and a yeah. chunk of hallway. And some of us sat in the hallway. And we were completely isolated from the rest of the company. And uh, many of us were fellow travelers from MUDS. We didn't all know each other beforehand, but about half of us had all worked on the same MUD mm. together, right? And so what happened was, I think the energy and dynamic of that core group swept all the energy along. And because we were isolated and Star trusted us to know what we were doing, um, even though we were young, we were able to put in place a whole bunch of pillars really early. And it wasn't until we then launched EA's first website ever. EA didn't know about it. We just launched it ourselves, went and got our own domain, just launched an FAQ saying, here's the crazy game we're making. And this was in the days when Usenet was the primary way that people communicated online. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Um, you know, we launched that that fact in 95, I think, 95 or early 96, somewhere in there. And it, people's imaginations caught fire. And we promised the moon. We weren't overthinking our whole PR management. Hey, don't overcommit and underdeliver or anything. We said, this is our dream. This is the the crazy thing we want to go build. And we put it up. And EA had estimated maybe 30,000 lifetime sales ever. And 
we couldn't afford to uh, get alpha testers into our alpha. So we said, send us five bucks so we can uh, duplicate a disc to mm. mail to you if you want to. And 50,000 people Amazing. sent us five bucks, wow. which meant that we had paid back EA's pilot project money off of you know the, wow. the alpha test that, that's like um uh, oh god i'm i'm blanking uh because i'm i'm so shocked uh the uh go fund no not go fund me yeah the... like an early kickstarter almost. yeah 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 yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Or, or an early you guys form, also invented access. that yeah you guys yeah, also invented yeah. early kickstarter yeah if if uh you have a copy of that first alpha disc by the way they go for a ton on ebay today Wow. There weren't that many of them and lots have been lost and broken. So it was only after that that EA figured out, oh, this might be a thing. Right. And I do think right. there were business decisions that went along with it. The choice to be on the open internet rather than be on Genie or AOL, right? The choice to charge a flat subscription fee rather than hourly, right? Those things matter just as much mm. to the adoption of the game. Right. The fact that, you know, within a year of launch, there were a quarter million people playing. Right. Incredible. Is, well, it that is it doesn't sound like much now. Right. But I think what what today's audience doesn't understand is you owe by itself 10 X the online world market Oh, by itself. First of all, 250,000, you know, people, you know, you and I, I think we're both heavily involved, you know. I was a very early Bitcoin guy, got in at nine bucks, you know, Ethereum at like eight, you know, so I've been, so I'm always, I pride myself in always being at the sort of at the edge of what's going on in technology. And currently there's, you know, like the big buzz around metaverse and all that stuff. I'm guilty of it myself. I believe that I'm building a metaverse type application, even though I think mine more like an MMO than anything else or a social network. But the biggest um, metaverse in the world right now, which is undoubtedly VR chat, right? Like in terms of pure UGC created content, all of the sort of Neil Stevenson checkboxes. Yeah. You could checked. make a case. I, I would make a case for Roblox, but we can have that argument no, later. No, no, no. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But Roblox, you know, we're the, but like I'm talking in the kind of the new sort of open um you know pers you know perspective minecraft too and like you can make a case for a lot of those for sure but in the sort of the new wave the most successful one only does about 27,000 daily active users right yep. sandbox which is inflated at billions of dollars of value literally does about 50 to 60 daily active users yeah you know this is one of the things that um wagner james al who's been writing about this stuff over at new world notes since early Second Life, right, likes to talk about a lot, which is that media hype versus usage are not particularly well correlated. <laughs> right, in, that's a very good in this point. space yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah. one thousand percent. So, 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 just to keep it flowing, because this is—I mean, we can again, we can talk about guitars for five hours, and then we can talk about <laughs> UO for another Easily. five hours. Yeah. But the the first time that the mainstream um, actually, and these are people that are playing PlayStation twos and and you know nintendo's actually started thinking about this concept of the mmo the massively multiplayer online game i think you have to attribute that moment that inflection point in culture to everquest and yes. everquest by sony online entertainment is another project that you worked on so nah so i actually came on I came on to EverQuest had already launched when mm -hmm. I joined Sony online. I was not involved in the original EverQuest. Sure. You were involved in the second one at EverQuest two. Yes. But yeah. as an executive, right? So I was, I was far away from the moment to moment day to day. I did things like uh, project reviews on it. I did stuff like um, things like the conversation interface, which mm. basically came over from galaxies. Uh, things like reviewing the the Fatui. I worked a fair amount with uh, Rod Humble, who was the EP on it, on uh, the crafting uh, moment to moment of the crafting experience. A few things oh, like interesting. that. But I I don't tend to claim EverQuest Two as my game in any way. Right, that yeah. would be doing a disservice to um, 
the folks who actually you know were there 40 hours or more a week right so then so then i apologize am i getting my history wrong that then your work on you know what i do believe is the greatest video game ever made <laughs> star wars galaxies actually predates your involvement with everquest uh right yes because i left origin in 2000 i guess and our team had been working on a privateer online MMO mm. that didn't come to fruition. And basically the team put ourselves on the market and um, as a unit and Sony online opened an Austin studio for us. And then we didn't expect it, but they handed us star Wars, <laughs> um, which had already, they'd already started working on star Wars. They'd been working on it for a while. Mm. a year and but it wasn't moving forward fast enough so they basically had us reboot the project so i worked on star wars galaxies until it launched in 03 and a little bit after just a few months after but i was promoted to an exec role at sony online in the middle of 03 mm. that meant that suddenly a whole bunch of games i started working on in that distant milestone reviewer chief creative officer way right and that included everquest 2 uh planet side untold legends um uh some psp titles like um untold legends was psp but frantics mm. and grip shift and uh uh and so on right like right so suddenly a whole bunch of games show up on my resume that i tended to be more distant from right i wasn't right. working on moment to moment the one that I actually worked on the most, and this is also post galaxies was untold legends, brotherhood of the blade, mm. but uh, a PSP single player action RPG. Uh, so yeah, chronologically, the next thing is galaxies. So first of all, so that's perfect for me because I, you know, I'd love to dig in on that um, with, for me, my, my star Wars galaxies um, experience is like none other that I've ever had in a video game. I, I made friends in that game that I have yet to meet to this day that we are still friends, that I consider them my kind of college buddies because of the incredible amount of social interaction that we had in that Star Wars Galaxies game. And, you know, full confession, I bought my first Jedi for about 800 bucks uh, back, back, in the, back in the old days. Because, like... I was running a company like, you know, uh, the amount of time necessary to invest in getting your own Jedi back in those days was so intense that it just wasn't a feasible reality for me. Right. And all of the folks, you know, that used to play with me that hear my confession. I know you probably suspected it anyway, back in the early days, because <laughs> right? back then they used to call you eBay if they thought you didn't play, you know, right. very, very good. But you know, for you know, for me, the thing about galaxies that I'm really, to be honest with you, trying to recreate in my experience is that thing that I think you have written theses about, about this concept of the sandbox versus the theme park. Mm -hmm. um, and with, with Star Wars Galaxies, it was like literally standing in place and just chatting with people could be the entire game. Like literally just going with one buddy to go visit a point of interest in some, you know, in Yavin 4 in the middle of nowhere while you're still literally the first level because your buddy has a speeder that you can both get in and travel out there and avoid the monsters could be the entire game. It's the ultimate expression, in my opinion, of systemic game design where you have this incredible plot of systems that can work great individually or can interact with each other to create incredible results. And I just want to sort of hear a little bit about your thoughts about how in the early days of Star Wars Galaxies, what the kind of high concept vision was for the game. Yeah, so Galaxies was deeply influenced by UO. Of course. And also by what we had been working towards with Privateer Online mm. that got killed. 
Um, the big difference is Privateer had a galaxy of procedurally generated planets with hundreds of planets. Mm. Um, and, uh, and galaxies did not. It had uh, relatively handcrafted environments. I say relatively because we invented a whole giant pile of proc gen to be able to deliver, uh, deliver the, the content. Um, and, and had to obey, you know, the Star Wars mythos really closely, right? So a whole bunch of different design choices had to be made around that. But um, the motivation, we first started talking about sandboxy versus theme park as a way to contrast um, the UO mode versus the EverQuest mode. Mm. And EverQuest to us old mud hands was deeply familiar. It was a Deku mud, which was one of the main branches of text muds. Um, the the tank nuker healer trinity leveling up zones with monsters um you know uh all of those tropes that we assume and take for granted now uh skill rotations uh all of those things came from deku muds right mm -hmm. which were invented in uh, i think it was um uh, 92 okay is when deku muds came along and they of course were an evolution of earlier kinds of muds um so we already knew what many of the the muds we'd worked on had been deco muds. We were very familiar with the benefits and the pitfalls. And there's tons of benefits, clear progression, regular dings and advancement feeling, um, a really great way of building party-based moment-to-moment teamwork that builds really strong ties. On the other hand, we also knew that it had massive economic issues in terms of the gameplay of a deco always, always starts to blow up economically because of a phenomenon called mudflation where as you keep adding more levels at the top you're you're devaluing everything else in the game and mm. you know the game economy starts to spiral out and you end up adding hacks like soul binding or level limits or whatever to prevent that you know from happening and it only works for so long mm. so uo had been designed against that that's why UO had a player-driven economy where we allowed prices to float. We originally tried a closed economy and it didn't work. That was one of UO's big experiments that uh, more crypto people need to go read about mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. most crypto systems are set up as closed economies and mm -hmm. they, they blow up in the same way UO's did mm -hmm. uh, through a lack of liquidity, right? Um, of course. So uh, when, we, when we got to Galaxies, Pretty sure we popularized the term sandbox and theme park to the gaming public. Right. I think that it wasn't part of the discourse really until then. Um, and we uh, we very consciously, uh, you know, well, we were under orders we, from Sony Online. We make always a sandbox, not a, not something that will cannibalize EverQuest. Right, right, right. Because we 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 over at Rockstar Games when we did GTA Three. Um, you know, we thought we owned the term sandbox, right? We thought that everybody had to sort of follow us. And then I remember that while I was at uh, Rockstar, a few of us were obsessively playing Star Wars Galaxies uh, in beta mode. And, right. you know, the great Sam Hauser, who's probably the most creative human I've ever met in my life, used to like, and he was a huge Star Wars fan, but he was very protective over his top guys doing anything but you know, working on GTA <laughs> and he would walk by us and he would see me and a producer who I'll leave his name out of it, playing SWG, trying to figure out what the hell we do in this thing. And he would get so mad at us, you know, <laughs> like what the fuck are you guys doing? You know, well, because, but, but yeah, you know, it's just like, anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, no, our, our producers would get mad that we were playing Unreal Tournament. Right. On UO, right. Our, the people would get mad that we were playing Quake. So right, right, I, right. I, that, that's just how uh, that and um, Command and Conquer and Warcraft 2, right? right? right. Like those are the, you know, so every <laughs> game team has the game that, <laughs> the game that disrupted their dev. You know? Right, right. Um, exactly. <laughs> so I, it, it's it's cool to think that we delayed GTA three. That that, that... <laughs> actually it was Vice City was what was the one uh, that, Vice City. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it was after GTA three had come out because I believe you guys came out in two three or yeah, two... Galaxies was originally meant to launch in um, on May the fourth, uh, right of two thousand three. And uh, it was nowhere near ready. Uh, one of the things I think, you know, uh, game projects have ballooned, of course, 
Mm. But I think if you look back at ever, all the features and the ambition that were in those uh, UO and Galaxies, both those were built in under three years. That's Galaxies incredible. was built in two years and nine months. That's incredible. And um, because there was a project reboot in there, right? So the version you saw was two years and nine months, which is bananas. Uh, <laughs> our content creation tools came online in December. And that is why, you know, there was hardly any content in the game. I begged for an additional year of development mm. and I was turned down. I was given, um, I was given a month more. It was like, okay, because you can polish for one more month. So we, we didn't come out May the 4th. We came out in June. We, we you know, just to, to kind of lift up, you know, the dress here a little bit, we spent around $12 million on GTA Vice City. Um, the rumor back then, and that was a big budget for a, mm -hmm. you know, for a video game back then. I mean, it still is today. Right. But back then for something on the heels of GTA three, which was such a massive success to get 12 was like, you know, decent, but right. the rumors back then were that SWG or S dub uh, as, um, as me and my friends call it, um, had a $35 million budget. Um, is that an accurate neighborhood or because suppose no, the... I, I do not believe so. I'm fairly sure that Swig was built for under 20. And I'm fairly sure that um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the dev proper was closer to 12 and mm. the rest of it was deployment costs. Right. Because right? um, MMO marketing. deployment costs are high. Yeah. Um, uh, but it definitely wasn't 35 uh, because. For what it's worth, later on, not that much later on, World of Warcraft comes out. Right, and, right, 2005. Um, it, it, uh, it had spent us into the dirt, yeah. right? I think launch WoW was around 80. And we're like, how do we compete against this? Right. Right? Um, so, yeah, it, you know, SWG, the part of the reason it was so systemic wasn't just the influences that we were bringing in it was meant to have a pile of content layered on top of the systems mm. and we ran out of time we didn't get to put that stuff in so you know lots of the individual systems you know as you say they were all meant to hang together mm. i thought of it picture almost like a node graph right mm. i visualized galaxies in my head as a sphere of nodes mm. and lines. Yeah, you're giving me chills, Raph. This is too much. This is too much. You know, to where, where, these, <laughs> where these systems interdepend. And when we ran out of time, I had to go, where can I break something off where the rest of the sphere doesn't like collapse? Right. right? And those breakpoints weren't always evident. We launched without land speeders or any other vehicles. Why? Because the sphere didn't collapse. You could still walk. And that meant that, yes, fast travel would be much better, but the game didn't disintegrate. Sure. We couldn't cut dancing. Dancing was structural because dancing was how you healed a type of wound damage. And if we took out the type of wound damage, then several professions fell out. And if we took out mm. those professions, then, you know, city building broke. And, you know, you know what I mean? Of course. So those structural dependencies were why we launched without vehicles without player run cities and governments and a few other features because we could see hey those are places where they're, they're only linked in one way we can add cities later nothing interesting in the base launch depended on the cities being present right um and we caught a ton of flack over that because you launched a star wars world without land speeders in it what are you doing right uh, it's just, why do you have hairdressing in but not <laughs> right but not land speeders if swg were to launch today none of those things would be issues because people have been so much more trained to play alphas and betas now and early releases and know the graduate like know that video games are services where back then everybody was used to a nice shiny box you open the box and you get a finished polished product right like the 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 psychology is much different in today's sort of gaming audience that it was back then but one thing that i have to get your thoughts on because i believe it might be one of the most genius things in a bible of genius ideas in game design is this something that i still to this day have never seen 
again, which is the incredible character class system of Star Wars Galaxies where you could literally play up to, I, I believe it was 32 classes. And not only can you play and master 32 different classes, but you could create your own hybridized version of these classes to pretty much invent completely new forms of, of gameplay. Um, and the way that you would level up the classes is just by gaining experience in those relative areas. And it, and it had zero level system back pre CU as we used to, you know, as right. we called it, there were no levels. There was only experience in a character that you couldn't see, obviously, by looking at them. Like, that you could only see by how the character actually acted. And to me, yeah. that is some mind-blowing level stuff. And I'm, first of all, I'm shocked it's never been done again, which, which is just, like, wild to me. People have such little expectations of players. But how did you guys come up with this masterful system of character progression? Yeah, do you want the, the crunchy design history version? Please, man, give me okay, anything. So give me anything. <laughs> the mud that we had all worked on beforehand was called Legend Mud. The mm -hmm. Deku model was you chose a class. The class did have skills. They were unlocked at specific levels. So you're a level 10 fighter. You now get, you know, headbutt or bash or whatever it is. Um, all, that was the basic Deku version. You couldn't multi-class, uh, you know, very, very classic, very EverQuesty, wowie, right? Like that. Um on Legend Mud, we had added a whole bunch of um, things that you could do that were outside the norm. Like we had an herbalism system where you could gather herbs, ones from the real world. Legend Mud was set in the real world and you time traveled to the mythology of different time periods. Mm. So, um, you know, one of the founders of the Mud was a history major. And that meant that she researched the actual historical medicinal uses of herbs then and we scattered them around the game in the correct places where they grew in the real world and you could brew them or turn them into poultices or whatever and they then had the magical effects that historically had been ascribed to them mm. right and so skills like that were popping up that didn't fit the class mold very well legend was classless as a result we um instead you were sort of classed by what where your character was created. If you were born in magic lands in history, you had an affinity for magic skills and you did worse using guns and vice versa. If you came from Victorian London, you, you were better that way. So we had already broken out of the mold of classes on legend mud. Mm. And it was because we were trying to add diversity of play. We get to UO. Ultima has never been a class-based series, right? But also wasn't much of a... It, it not only wasn't class-based, uh, it started out as a party-based RPG. Most people don't know this, but the Ultima series, uh, you know, for younger folks, Ultima is what Final Fantasy is today. It was right. the single most influential RPG series in history. Mm -hmm. The entire genre of JRPGs is based on Ultima. Mm -hmm. The no whole doubt. thing. No all doubt. of it. Yeah. Right? Those early Dragon Quests or whatever are rips of Ultima. From yeah. early on, right? So massively, massively influential. But they'd moved off of party and towards single character, and that meant that the whole classes thing fell out. So, uh, and they'd added things like baking bread and whatever. On, on Legend Mud, we had been talking for years about, you know what we ought to do is take a tip from non-D&D pen and paper systems and use a skills-based, a skill tree system so that we can unlock headbutt after bash, right? Mm. Just that kind of sequential thing to give a little more sense of progression because we still used a level-based combat advancement system. Um, when we got to UO, we had things like, we, uh, but we need to level you up in baking bread and we need to level you up in tailoring, and right? And so we said, okay, are we going to do a tree? And we ended up, it, it didn't happen. Partly because trees, we'd worked on trees for years on Legend Mud and never actually gotten it in, right? Mm. So we ended up with a system most familiar today from Elder Scrolls, which is a use-based advancement system. You try to do something, like jump, you have a percentage chance of getting better at jumping. Mm. And that's how UO advancement worked. 
and we just had a straight old percentage. That's all it was. With sort of an asymptotic, it gets harder and harder to yeah, go up that, as you go. That little yellow bar that would go in those yeah. little beautiful blue boxes. <laughs> that fell prey to macroing. And it, it did. Um, to this day. So, to this day, it's a huge problem. It's a problem in Elder Scrolls too, right? So when we did galaxies, we said, okay, it's time to reopen skill trees. The way to solve the macroing problem is to bring back some of that XP level unlock thing. And, and that's what we did. We kept the idea that each of these are completely separate parallel advancement tracks. Why? Because in UO, so many people said, I'm a tailor shopkeeper and I never fight. Mm. We said, we have to retain that. Sure. So the result was the skill tree system, which actually didn't work quite the way we wanted. The trees in galaxies ended up being all exactly the same shape. Right? Yes. Which led us to invent a lot of filler. And that was because of a time thing. We tried building a looser web and ran out of time. Mm. Today, of course, that system is actually all over the place because people call it talent trees. Right. Right. right so right. I, I wouldn't say that it's not around. It's more that class based systems now use classes as the intro. And then when you get to a certain point, they break you out into talent trees, which are basically skill trees stacked on top of classes. Mm, it's a fair right? point. Yeah. So, so that's how the development of that happened. Um, I, I have come to see all of this through the lens of how players engage in cooperation and teamwork. Mm. And I have come to see classes as being like positions on a sports team. Extremely high trust level required, which is why pugs suck, you know, pickup groups. Um, moment to moment interaction required. So coordinating, getting your friends online. So you have a well-tuned group. You got to practice. You got to come to know each other. And that serves a very particular social role, right? But it's also very intense. Most of us don't have teams that we are part of like that right like it's like saying i hey i play i have a bowling league or i have a soccer team i play with and they count on me to be the goalie right like that's what grouping is like in a class-based system people have to have knowledge and expertise around around their domain a skill tree system pushes you away from moment to moment interaction some and pushes towards what i call weak tie so things like asynchronous interdependence. I rely on you because you are the source of my armor. Mm. Doesn't mean that I need to be even online at the same time as you are. Right. But I know that your shop's the best source. Oh, so man. that means I'm not going to ever player kill you. Uh, right? Like it drives different levels of trust and different kinds of social dynamics. And I think one of the big lessons of MMO design over time has been to look at our systems and really think about what are they for? What are the social dynamics that they drive? I'm a huge believer today in the asynchronous stuff and in the weak tie stuff because it builds lasting communities. And it, um, you know, we, we used to talk about the fact that galaxies objectively had metrics data about the strength of its community being stronger than all the other SOE games. To this, and I believe that was maybe amazing. maybe to this day, maybe yeah. maybe 15 years after it's been shut down, it might still have better data of people. More people have probably attended each other's weddings from Star Wars Galaxies than any other video game. It's just and and, and to me, you know, look, and I want to be respectful of your time. I know we're, we we have about 12 minutes here. Yeah. Uh, but the the thing that frustrated me so much about world of warcraft when it first came out and of course when wow first came out you know swg was going through this rough patch you know sort of transitioning between you know what i thought was the best point of the game to be honest with you the trials of obi-wan i thought swg was at its best in peak cu trials of obi-wan but you know there was rumors of this cut back and NGE and all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, you know, some people started migrating over to WoW. WoW was, you know, picking up steam at that point. And one of the things that shocked me the most when I got to WoW was that I couldn't, if I played Horde, 
I couldn't talk to Alliance. And if you were Alliance, you couldn't talk to Horde. And in, in SWG, in my server, um, you know, um, you know, I played on Gorath. I don't know if you're familiar with your own yeah, servers, yeah. but I played on Gorath. And in the Gorath server, it evolved over time, but during the SC, you know, the CU peak feed was kind of like the social center of the community. Everybody would hang out at feed, figure out what to do, and then they would go on from there. Part of the entire community building of that game was the rebels and the Imperials talking crap to each other in feed, right? Sure. You know, and, and, and this element of knowing your enemy like you know thyself, right? The sort of <laughs> essence of Sun Tzu was not present in WoW. And to me, that's why WoW never really stuck to me because I never knew who my enemies were, right? Like, like I never had that, like, rivalry, right? You, you yeah. only created rivalries with other Horde guilds or other Alliance guilds, not with the opponent of the game structure. So there's a design history to that too. Mm. The um, the reason WoW did that was a couple of things, right? You, UO had had free form PvP. Anybody could PK anybody outside of town. And the town boundaries were fairly limited. And this led to a horrendous, horrendous level of churn as players were chased out by giggling, you know... <laughs> You know, giggling maniacs, basically, right? Um, and, and like, no joke. We, uh, I'm fairly sure, Ultima Online churned out more people in its first year mm. than EverQuest had. Right. Okay. Like, it was a lot. And they went to EverQuest where there was a PK switch, and you could be a hundred percent safe. Right. Today, that has ended up descending in through Minecraft into the entire survival game genre which is deeply, deeply UO inspired, right? Mm. Um, but that meant that everybody was allergic. The whole industry was allergic to free form player versus player. The shining exception was a game called Dark Age of Camelot, sure. which was done by Mythic Entertainment, which yeah. eventually got popular. Very popular EA. game, yeah. And the folks behind Mythic, like Mark Jacobs and Matt Firer, who went on to do Elder Scrolls, um, those guys had worked on text-based games on the online services before making graphical MMOs. And they had adopted a model, like, you know, probably came from them to some degree, uh, called Realm versus Realm. And what that said was, hey, chop the world into teams and let them fight each other. But to minimize the griefing that existed on things like UO, DAOC made it so that if you were on one team, you couldn't talk to the other two teams, mm. right? Be and it, it was to minimize the insane levels of harassment that happened. UO literally had a player killer do things like walk up to an avatar, discover the avatar was a little kid who was playing illegally, kill their pet cat in front of them, skin it, cook it, and then give them the <laughs> pie of their pet, causing right. untold trauma to some poor seven-year-old, right? Like, that kind of stuff was going on, and it resulted in hours-long customer service calls. So right. Everybody was extremely conservative about that in that next wave of MMOs. UO had shown, wow, the internet is a dark and disturbing place. Right. Which, bear in mind, there were no social networks, and the the vast majority of people who were on Usenet were adopting Netiquette. And, uh, you know, that whole September had, that had never ended. That whole thing of the internet is now the mass audience as opposed to university students was changing internet culture radically. And UO was right there in the midst of that happening. So we had no idea how bad it was going to get. Like, no idea. So all those games were very conservative. WoW basically lifted the DAOC model and said, hey, if you're Horde, you can't talk to Alliance in order to prevent harassment. That mm. is almost certainly why they did what they did. Now, the interesting thing is in Galaxies, because the setting did not allow us to do realm versus realm, okay? In DAOC, you could run around and play if you were inside Albion or whatever. You could play PvE and just not go to the frontier and you would be fine, right? 
we couldn't do that with galaxies. So mm. we were not able to steal that model. If we had been able to, we probably would have. Oh man, I'm so glad you did allow it. it. Right. So instead, we had to come up with a PvP system that let people feel like they were in the movies. And that was a tough design nut to crack. And we ended up with a system called temporary enemy flagging, tough. which was built on top of we, UO's criminal flagging. We, we use that term in my game to this day. <laughs> yeah, TEF, temporary yeah. enemy flagging. Yeah. And um, you know, we could dive into the minutia, but it basically boils down to if you do something to the other side, you're vulnerable for a time window. Right. And that had originated with UO. That's how we did it in UO to try to deal with the player killing there. Um, and we just brought it in and married it to the PK switch. In UO, it was uh, it didn't block PvPing. It just allowed you to report them for murder. In Galaxies, we made it block PvPing. That actually opened up player versus player play dramatically. It went from a one to three percent of the audience to something like, I forget, a double digit percentage. And as a result, we were able to get a lot of that feeling in there. And because you still ended up needing to transact with the enemy commercially, mm. the trash talking got bad, but never horrendous. Right. You know what I mean? It felt real. It felt like yeah. real rivalries. Yeah. Wow ended up putting in temporary enemy flagging. If you go read the launch FAQs for World of Warcraft, they actually did the DAOC model, but with flagging. That's yeah. how they ended up doing it. So um, at the time, TEFs got a lot of negative feedback, but it actually ended up uh, working out and, and I guess influencing stuff too. So one of my favorite, you know how like as a gamer, you have those moments where these, okay, these are my favorite game experiences. And you remember that one moment, right? Like for me, I have a few you know, the first time I played GTA Vice City and I said to myself, I know I'm the first human being on the planet to play a build of this game that I know is going to be gigantic, right? Like there's moments that you have, right? And for me, one of those moments was when I actually unlocked my first Jedi during the CU sort of village system, right? Which I actually had like a noob Jedi that I actually unlocked. Yeah. And you had to grind back then. And if you died, you lost like, I, th I think it was like 250,000 XP every time you died. So it was brutal, right? Because it would take you eight hours just to get like 120,000, right? So anyway, but the moment that I'm speaking of was I was grinding in somewhere in the middle of Corellia and we were like doing like spin groups, we used to call them where you just, just to get all these animals together and you sort of spin attack them and you would grind for XP. And I remember like having so much fun, just talking crap, just grinding to these guys. And I hear off in the distance, ju -ju 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 and like we look and everybody starts saying, bounty hunter, bounty hunter. <laughs> and I was the only Jedi in this group, even though I hadn't level capped yet. And one guy had a macro that opened up a speeder immediately, invited me immediately, and then I hopped on the speeder, and then he hopped on and he drove to the water because the bounty hunter couldn't attack me over the water. Mm -hmm. And I must have been like floating on that water in that speeder in front of that bounty hunter for three hours, oh, just, no. talking, <laughs> just talking crap to them. But my point is, this system of bounty hunting that you guys introduced into Star Wars Galaxies might be the coolest gameplay system ever made, period. Like this idea of you're a bounty hunter, you track a contract that's somehow emergent because of the game rules, then you have to have tools necessary to track this target down across an entire galaxy of planets, then you got to track them down again. Then you got to keep tracking them down. And then it creates a forced 1v1 PvP system that's completely emergent. That That is just, I mean, just thinking about it today, it's still mind-blowing. Um, so, yeah, and this probably has to be the last question, alas. But yeah. um, I think the key thing, and this is important about galaxies, for especially from a design point of view, since we're being really crunchy system designing here. Yeah. 
if you think about the implementation need for that and what it takes to build a system like that, the answer is it's actually really simple. Mm. Galaxies, we tried to build a lot of really simple systems that hung together. So you unlock Jedi and we, you know, there's a whole thing there. Yeah. But we didn't get into that Jedi, at all. So you have to. Yeah, we didn't. But um, which, which, which is good. Right. You, yeah, you got to give me props for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you unlock Jedi. And fundamentally, there's just a visibility number on you. The more you use the power, the visibility number goes up. Mm. It decays with time. It's incredibly simple, basic little system. If it gets visible enough, generate a kill contract, which is just a kill mission, which is just using the same kill mission that's already there for killing womp rats, mm. right? Then there's how does the bounty hunter find you? And that really boiled down to just a set of really, really simple tracking random dice rolls, right? That's like awesome. nothing very fancy. And then at the end of it, what is involved? Setting each other's mutual PvP flags so that mm. you can fight each other. But because really? there were wrinkles like, oh, but people are always safe in their house or, you know, because they could deny permission. But then you add a simple thing like, ah, you can deny permission to people, but not to their little robot pet. So it can fly over the roof and kill you <laughs> anyway or, you know, whatever. Right. Simple little atomic stuff glued together. That's what makes the sandbox work. That's what made galaxies work, even though, frankly, candidly, as much as people love it most of the individual bits in there were broken. <laughs> oh, right? I know that. I know that. I know that. <laughs> Trust me. I know that better than anybody. I ran my own galaxy server for eight months. So um, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 I wish we could keep talking, but I, I only have an hour and there's people. Oh man, for me Ralph, this meeting. has been amazing, man. Thank you so much. Um, I'd love to keep in contact with you. One day I would be honored if you have a VR headset. Uh, my game is available on Oculus and closed beta. If you ever want to check it out, I would love to show it to you because everything about that game pretty much is inspired by your work. Um, oh, and, and, and I'd love to show it to you. I'm very proud of it. And yeah, man, this has been a beautiful conversation and hopefully we get a chance to chat again one day, sir. Yes. And uh, my PR guy would kill me if I didn't mention um, uh, your, your listeners should check out playable worlds, go to mm -hmm. playableworlds.com. We are working on a game that is the spiritual successor to everything that we just talked about. Beautiful. Plus a whole bunch of, frankly, mind-blowing new stuff the industry has never seen before. So, cool. so uh, I, check out the website, visit the Discord, all of that. I will get all the info from your PR guy posted down below so that people can go check this out. If Raf is making it, if he's saying these incredible things, I'm sure it's very, very cool to check out. So, Raf, thank you so much, sir. And I look My forward pleasure. to our paths crossing again, and hopefully there's no taps on us. Because then... <laughs> You know what it means. Red is dead. <laughs> All right. Thank All right. you so much, sir. My pleasure. Thanks.